Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, located right here in Middletown, Connecticut. And once again, I'm interviewing a faculty member here whose name is Adam Floridia. And those of you who've been following this program for a long time have heard him talk before. He teaches English and he is a bibliophile. He loves to read. And back in the day before he had two children, when he was, you know, living the life of leisure, he was reading a book a week. Yeah, my goal is 52 books a year. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you now? I've at least tried to keep up a good goal. I've cut it in half too, with two kids. It's So I'm 26 a year. I just made 26 last year. I'm already on pace this year. We're only three weeks in. Good. Or four, four weeks four in. Four weeks in? Yeah. So I what got did, two books down. What, okay, what were those two books? This year, I've read amazingly two five-star books. I probably mentioned before, there's um, a social media site that's really just for book nerds, goodreads.com. It's the only social media I'm on. And you write reviews and you rate books. So I'm always thinking one star, didn't like it, five stars, loved it. And I try to be sparing with my five stars. Um, I read, for the first time, Our Town by Thornton Wilder hadn't read it and it was amazing I couldn't believe how much he did with so little I would love to see the play performed it's very postmodern breaking the fourth wall that's that's right up my sort of wheelhouse another one was a book I discovered thanks to Goodreads called The Plains by Gerald Murnane I believe is the man's name never heard of him not familiar with the book at all until I read someone else's review on Goodreads and it sounded interesting. He's an Australian author, and it was actually a fitting one to read right after Our Town because it was another one where it's very sparing in many senses. Um, it's set in the middle plains of Australia where it's not, it's simultaneously about nothing and everything, which I know is paradoxical, but that's what one of the things I loved about the book. Uh, and I'm just starting my third book, which is uh, Sinclair Lewis's classic, It Can't Happen Here. So I'm only 50 pages in, and it's really good so far. So uh, these are great recommendations. And goodreads.com is a good recommendation. Highly recommend it. Uh, <laughs> Friend me. There, there are so many ways to get lists of new books. You know, there's the New York Times book list reviews, and they, they're all broken down into, like, fiction, nonfiction, paperback self-help or something. There are all these different categories. So sometimes I feel overwhelmed when I look at it. I don't know where to start. I think because I tend not to read much contemporary, every once in a while, I've read actually a couple decent contemporary novels at the end of 2016, but I really get most of my, I'm still working my way through classics. Except I hadn't read Our Town. That's a classic. Um, Sinclair, the It Can't Happen Here has been on my bookshelf for probably six or seven years. And I've got a lot of other books like that, that if I have no recommendations, it's easy for me to go and pull something off. But I've found rather than going with general lists or bestseller lists or recommendations, it's I love that Goodreads because I have people whose, I know their tastes are similar to my own. So if I read a review and they say something's good, I'll check out the book. And if it sounds good, then end up getting it. And And it's, it's interactive, so you could write a review? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's actually probably, unfortunately, that's what keeps me writing the most since I haven't written anything for publication in a while. And it keeps me paying attention to the book. I, I annotate, I have the disease where I cannot read without a pen in my hand. It makes me feel like my annotations are a little more worthwhile because afterwards I'll go back and I'm like, okay, what were the important things in this book? What do I want to make sure goes into my review? And nobody probably reads the reviews but me, but they're a way of, for me, it's valuable to catalog my thoughts uh, just to get everything down and kind of, especially if um, I read if I read 52 or even 26 books a year and you ask me, oh, so you read this early in the year, how was it? I, um, well, let's see, that was 10 books ago. Let me think, hold on. The easiest thing for me to do is, let me go check my Goodreads. Oh, yeah, I really liked it. And here are the main, the main things I really liked about it. Yeah, God, keeping track of life is really difficult. <laughs> keeping track of time is even more difficult. We've got to take a break. Uh, because our time has elapsed, and we will be right back after this message. Well, we're back to the Middlesex Moments radio show, and Adam Floridia, who teaches English here at Middlesex Community College, and I'm Anna Wasesha, and we're both lovers of books. That's, That's the issue, and so over the break, we've been having this incredible conversation that has ranged far and wide. But let me just kind of back up to my ulterior motive for asking you to come in and be on the radio show, which is, I am really, really worried about the reduction of human communication to 140 characters in a tweet, 30-second commercials on television, headlines in all the online newsletters that you can subscribe to, thousands of them, where people really 
feel that they've been informed by just reading a series of headlines. So just this, mm-hmm. this and you know what we've lost by not really being patient with the time it takes to read an entire novel or read a very long story that has a lot of detail in it like you would find in the New Yorker or the Atlantic or even you know in the newspapers there was a time when a newspaper story an in-depth newspaper story would go on for pages because the, you're learning they're teaching you a lot about the subject they're not just giving you the surface information so help me not feel so desperately concerned about the stage we are all at where we just are reducing everything to the most minimal I don't know how much I can help you I can sympathize with you know that you have a uh, someone a kindred spirit in that sense as I mentioned Goodreads was my only social media so I don't tweet or Twitter or any of that stuff do the little quick messages and I'm kind of a luddite when it comes to technology I refuse to read books even on a screen I've got to have the print and the paper and in my classes and I, I assume this goes for hopefully all college classes especially I think the ultimate goal of any college class is to get students to think. Not necessarily, I don't tell students what to think, but help teach them how to think and maybe give them things to think about. And for them, learning has been often a an instant gratification. You need to know something, you look it up quickly, or you get the, the quick snippet, and you need that information right away. Information is so easily accessible these days. But to actually understand and synthesize and analyze that information and then to create something new with it whether it's forming an opinion or actually taking action on something you've learned takes time and for that reason I make sure my students in English 101 it's called composition know that I really stress reading writing and thinking the course is called composition that means writing so you guys think you're here you're gonna do a heck of a lot of writing yes you are but I'm in my syllabi I generally assign more there's more reading than writing and I find that and I hold them accountable for the reading they have to journal they take dialectical notes on um, every article they read and in 101 it's short contemporary not well actually not necessarily contemporary just short nonfiction pieces that may have appeared in newspapers or magazines elsewhere and students actually have to read them because they have to react to them and they have to write down their reactions to different parts and in the beginning of the semester Students don't love the assignment. Uh, It's tedious because not only does it force them to read something from beginning to end without skimming, but they actually have to take the time to think about what they're reading. You can't react to something and say it was funny or it was terrible or I agree or I disagree or it was sad or it was funny unless you are actually absorbing the information. And that takes time. Reading takes time. Good reading takes even longer. By the end of the semester, the vast majority of students say that was their favorite assignment all semester. And it's by far the most work they did is it should I should I get rid of the journal assignment in future years? What do you think? No, that really may and I think my favorite compliment that I ever get in the course evaluations are if a student says, I became a stronger reader, writer, and thinker because of this course. Because I echo that phrase a lot. So when I hear that they kind of even took that away. And and it, and it takes time. They're not so many students aren't used to reading almost at all, reading anything more than 144 characters. I mean, we read every day. They read Facebook posts, but it's that instant click here, click here, get this headline, get that. I think the sustained reading is something that a skill that needs to be consciously thought and consciously assigned. And students have asked with my journal assignment, I make them do 10 per unit. We have three units. So ultimately they read at least 30 relatively short articles and and have to respond in writing to them. And some say, well, I proved I can do this because I did it on one. Yes, you proved you can do it. You wrote a summary of the article and you responded. That's great. Practice makes better. It's not whether or not you can do the assignment. This is one assignment that's not mastering a skill. It's cultivating a type of thinking. And so, you know, when you leave my class, you don't ever have to journal on anything. But I hope you at least go through the process of thinking and start to slow down when you read. And if you don't have to write up a journal for yourself or anyone else, annotate. At least you see the books that I brought, that I brought in with me today, and they've got my scribbles all over them because I tell I, I have a disease where I cannot read without a pen in my hand, and that forces me to go one, a little slower, but to comprehend what I'm reading. I'm sure we've all had the experience where we read something. The teacher said, uh, "Read chapter one." Okay, I'm a good student. I'll read it. Did you read it? Yes, I read it. It was 30 pages. What did you read? I don't know. I don't remember. Heck, halfway through by page 15, I was already thinking about uh, what I'm going to do this weekend. 
I read it, but then that's a complete waste of time if you're reading and not getting anything out of it. So if you're annotating, taking notes in any fashion, you have to be paying attention. You can't underline something if you don't think that sentence is good, if you don't have some reaction to it. And like I said, I think, I don't know, just as long as teachers keep assigning reading and holding students accountable for it and expose them to it, and it's, it's, I tell them, it's, bribe, it's bribing, rewarding, threatening. If you don't read, then you get a zero. However you want to look at it, it's, it's something that they need to make a habit of. And hopefully after they leave my classes, they feel more comfortable reading and they will continue to read on their own and when they read to hopefully think critically and analyze what they're reading. So I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that. No, as you're talking, I'm thinking about the fact that I'm, you know, and of course I'm older, so I've, you have more, I have more life to process. So as I look back on it, for me, writing is thinking. Right? It, it, it's an expression of my thinking. And, and it's my sense that students aren't, they don't come to college having the experience of writing lengthy discourses on what they read or what they were thinking about uh, about what they read. And so what, what, how do you do that? How do you get them to stretch out their thinking? So, or do you, do you find that they struggle with that? By still, by going back to that, that reading, writing, and thinking are inexorably linked. And I say, it's a composition class. We're two and a half weeks into the semester now. I haven't told, we've gone over some grammar stuff, but I haven't told them how to write a paper yet. And I've assigned the paper so they know the topic so that they can be thinking about it. I say, don't, nobody start this paper because I haven't told you how to write. The goal is that by the time it comes to write this, this paper, academic essays are pretty formulaic and basic formula to, to follow. And students' biggest hurdle is often staring at that blank white screen and not knowing. By the time we get to the actual writing part, which is going to be in another week, you should have so many ideas from all the reading you when you read, you're thinking. And then my classes up till now have been discussion. We're like, what do you guys think about? What? Let's pull out ideas. Let's develop ideas. Expand ideas. And by the time it comes down to sit and actually write, it should be easy. You should, if it's almost a fill in the blank formulaic type essay, you've got the thinking that's going to go in there. You've got the ideas. So getting them to read is my way of getting them to think and then hopefully produce something. The thoughts are there. And like you said, if writing is an expression of your thoughts, mm -hmm. they've already formulated their thoughts through their journals, through class discussion, through their own independent reading and thinking while they're going through that. Trying to frame it that way, I think it, it helps me too. I take a survey in the beginning of my class. How many students can read, can write, and can think. And joke, everyone, you know, can. How many students enjoy reading, enjoy writing, enjoy thinking? How many students consider themselves good at reading and writing and thinking? And almost every year for, I think I've been teaching 101 for eight years now, most students consider themselves good at thinking and enjoy thinking the most. Next is they are good at reading and enjoy reading the most, and that's usually about half the class. And then a small fraction of the class see, see themselves as good at writing and therefore they don't enjoy writing. So put that data, okay, take away a few things. One, we tend to enjoy what we're good at. Great. But if I can get in your head that reading, writing, and thinking are similar and they're, and they're intertwined, if you consider yourself a good thinker, there's no reason you can't be a good writer. Writing is the easiest thing to teach. Writing is, here are the rules to follow. All you've got to do is memorize the rules. Teaching, when we used to have standalone developmental reading classes here at the college, those were much harder to teach. Teaching good reading is tough. And we talk about why students might lack confidence in their writing. And it's because what have they been getting for, for years in school is they hand something in and it comes back with red all over it. That's what is most easy to criticize, which also means that's the easiest thing, like I said, I think to fix and to address where you're sitting across from me and looking at me right now and I have no idea what you're thinking. So I can't mark it up in red pen and say, oh, well, that thought was okay. And similar to reading, you don't really get criticized on the reading until you produce something that shows whether or not you understood it, and then that's linked to writing. So if I can get them to hopefully buy into your reading and your thoughts on this matter, and that's what the, the journal assignment is, what did you think about? There's no right or wrong that's an assignment. It's informal writing. I'm not grading on spelling or grammar. Just react to the piece realistically, and then that shows that you've read it, you understood it, you've got brilliant ideas. Now let me show you how to put those into an organized essay and hopefully that, that process tends to work. 
Yeah, you've been doing it for eight years. <laughs> With minor tweaks along the way, but... <laughs> you know, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's still so complicated, that process. That, I mean, I always, you know, I hand it to faculty members and teachers of all sorts who are willing to, you know, kind of start out at the beginning and say, I, I, even if you don't know much about writing, thinking, and reading, I'm going to get you to a point where you do, and we, we, we hope you enjoy it. So we have to take another break because Tempest Fugit, and we'll be right back. And then I want to talk about Kurt Vonnegut just a little bit. All right. Okay. Well, welcome back to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show, and I'm Anna Wasesha, and today my guest is Adam Floridia. And we've been talking about writing and reading and thinking, and what's the matter with kids today? That kind of idea, you know, <laughs> that everybody's doing everything in 140 characters or less. But in the last segment of the show, I wanted to talk about Kurt Vonnegut because... I was so excited that you got to teach an entire course on Vonnegut. Me too. Yeah, my like my favorite course in uh, undergraduate English was a course devoted to two authors, Sylvia Plath and Theodore Recchi. And it was like being in the lap of luxury to read pretty much everything Plath had written and almost everything Recchi had written. And I felt like I, I got to know them as people. I mean, you know, I, they, mm-hmm. they brought me into their heads and their hearts and it was fantastic so tell me what was that like and you know i mean first i suppose the first question is why vonnegut he's been my favorite author since i discovered him my senior year of college i love satire his writing style is so simple the reading level is really easy but he manages to express some really big ideas in that simple style a lot of my personal beliefs have been shaped have kind of resonated with things he was putting forth and then some of his ideas obviously influenced some of my own thinking and he's just been my favorite author since I discovered him um, that's I did my master's thesis on his canon uh, so being able to teach a class here Kyle's class on Bonnie is, is was just awesome, like, it is awesome. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm almost at a lack of uh, loss of words <laughs> yeah like, well tell us about Vonnegut I mean who who was Kurt Vonnegut? Kurt Vonnegut, American author, looked a lot like Mark Twain. Huh? He served in World War II. It's one of the books, Slaughterhouse-Five, is about the firebombing of Dresden. Yeah, and that's his big breakthrough. If anyone knows Kurt Vonnegut, they'll probably, Slaughterhouse-Five would be the one book they would know. You mentioned getting to know authors in the course you took. Mm-hmm. What's nice about my class was I gave a whole biography on Vonnegut in the beginning and we brought up things from his life and how they might have influenced his novels or, or not. But his, many of his novels are so autobiographical that it's hard not to get to know him reading them, um, especially his, his final novel, Timequake. It's, more, it's half autobiography, half novel. And I think that was either the first or second book I read by Vonnegut. And it was that the human in the book that I really liked that... It was there was a real person, and that's also I, I like postmodernism, and postmodernism ha, postmodernism has a lot of breaking the fourth wall, and the author um, kind of destroying the artifice of fiction and talking directly to the reader, and he does that in a voice that's so genuine and caring and thoughtful. So it was, it was great to get to introduce him to the, the handful of students that I had. Mm-hmm. Um, he served in World War II, as I was saying. He was he fought in the Battle of the Bulge, was captured by Germans and sent to Dresden, which um, was described as Florence on the Elbe, a beautiful city, a cultural mecca at the time. Now, no really defenses uh, in, for, for no German defenses because it was a civilian city. There was no reason anyone would target it. He was kept in a, a slaughterhouse. That's where him and the other hundred or so POWs were kept. And one day, I think it was, a, I think it was Palm Sunday, actually. The air raid sirens went off, and Vonnegut, uh, the other POWs, and the, his handful of captors went down into the basement of the slaughterhouse. Went down, you know, and outside is just, again, this beautiful, cultural, brilliant city. And they hear bombs for a day, and when they go up, it's walking up into hell. He describes it as the largest massacre in European history. His numbers were around 300,000 to 500,000 people got killed. I, I've since read estimates that that's not accurate, but still imagine going down and having death rained on you. What happened was the British sent planes over. I think the Americans first bombed to create a bunch of debris, and then the British flew over and sent incendiary bombs to start fires. So it was it was hell on earth. 
and his job after that was to dig corpses out of the remains and that shaped his life in one of his later nonfiction pieces that uh, he published a letter that he wrote home it was the first letter he wrote since he'd been captured to his parents so it's that's one of the most powerful letters a young 19 year old writing dear mom and dad by the way i'm alive here's what happened here's what i survived in a twist of fate i think it was at the university of chicago we went and got started a a master's degree program after coming back to the states and i think it was the story is one of the admissions officers when he found out vonnegut was in dresden um, during the bombing said boy we were really sorry to do that he had been one of the pilots oh, who yeah flew over and, and bombed right Right, of course, not even a man. I mean, there were so many things to think about, but not imagining that American soldiers would be there and be imprisoned. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think this is one of the most important things. I'll, I'm going to circle back to this is why people need to read and read extensively, long, sit for hours and read, is that it, what, he, what Vonnegut was exploring in that novel was what does it mean to be human? Yep. And that's a, that's a task we all have, we have got to apply ourselves to. And then, and then it translates into what does it mean? What are we going to do about Syria and the refugee crisis? I mean, because if we haven't done that first piece, which is to figure out what does it mean to be human and for me to be human, yep. and I, I learned that by reading people like Vonnegut. And Vonnegut was president of the Humanist Society. That's oh, how he was. Um, yeah. He was. He described himself as a Christ worshiping agnostic. Mm. So didn't necessarily believe. Came descended from German free thinkers loved Christ's ideas about compassion. He says, the Sermon on the Mount and the Gettysburg Address are the two most beautiful things ever written. And his definition of humanism was being a decent person without expectation of reward or punishment in the afterlife. Being a good person just to be a good person and looking out for others. I argue that at the center of his canon is the, the singular question of why are we here? It's, you know, the great existentialist question mm -hmm. and his novels seek to answer that in various ways and in his final novel he mentions he um, asked his adult son a doctor at the time and his, his son said dad we're here to help each other get through this whatever it is and that's one of my favorite messages for the purpose of life there's no better answer than to help each other get through this whatever it is and all of those things are essentially descriptions of what we think of as virtue or the good so the the hero is is trying to explore and then achieve to some degree a sense of of goodness you know the affirmation of your own existence yeah you know yeah so it, what was it like teaching your students about fun again is it, is it a kind of age thing i mean you have to be from your perspective or no okay um, this oh my god the class was so there were eight students in it four of them were probably 65 70 and up Oh. And the other four were 25 and under. And it was, first of all, the, the class dynamic was phenomenal because it was a small, just daily discussion. It was like a little book club, almost. The students got along really well. We just sat around a conference table and talked about the books. And they obviously knew I'm a huge Vonnegut fan. And you don't have to be. Not everyone's going to like everything. So even students who might not have liked, we read four novels, um, Planning the syllabus was, I know I go on tangents, <laughs> planning a syllabus was the hardest thing because I'm like, hmm, he wrote 14 novels. There's 16 weeks. Can we do a book? No, nah, that's probably asking too much. How many books? Okay, I'll look four. Four will be okay. We'll do four units. Um, and even students who didn't enjoy the books as they read them, tell me, they, they loved the course and they loved the experience. And they even if they didn't like the book, they could appreciate it because they knew so much about the man who wrote it. And they could make the connections between the thematic links from this novel to this novel to this novel. I asked at the end of the semester how many people were going to read another Vonnegut book, and everyone said they, they planned to. Good, and good. I don't think it was just to butter me up, because the, the grades were all set by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. when I was in undergraduate school in English literature, the, it was a period of time where we were only supposed to deal with the text. It was, and, and there was no context. Mm -hmm. And I it, now maybe that's why I just eat up the stories of the author's lives. You know, and wh who, where were they and what did they do and what did they think and what, how were they influenced by other people and who were their best friends and who did they marry and all, the, all these various things helped me to put their work in a context. The students loved, too, that it was a class on one author. Like you said, that's what right. you remember from class. Right. 
because they'd never had a class like that. So they could talk, what, who are you going to do next? Can you, oh, one, it's, you should do Dickens. You should do Poe. Like, ah, I don't know. I'm an expert. I consider myself an expert on Vonnegut. I have other favorite authors. I can see if I can do another course. But the problem is in enrollment stuff. I tried offering the class last fall and it was canceled due to low enrollment. This time it luckily ran. I was going to teach it for additional responsibilities, essentially for free, and had enough to get it to run, which was great. Mm-hmm. And, like, But it was cool to see them excited about learning yeah. <laughs> in, in general and then yeah. especially about learning about something that I was so passionate about yeah I mean well I can hear it in your voice and I one of my it, it was a course in statistics but is Don McEachern was his name and he uh he would come in and it's like I, can't, I got something I got to tell you about statistics <laughs> I can't wait to tell you this part and it, it was infectious so it, and that's a good it's a wonderful way to teach I'm afraid we got to close out this radio program but I want to thank you for coming in today and Talking about why we should read and telling me all about Kurt Vonnegut. He's, uh, I, I only knew about Slaughterhouse-Five, so I, I feel like I would like to read some more of his work. I'll give you a reading list. Okay, that's, that sounds good. Uh, so thank you listeners for being with Adam Floridia and with me for this half hour. And if you'd like to find out more about Middlesex Community College, you can find us on the World Wide Web at mxcc.edu. Well, I want to thank you for being with us during this radio program, and I'm wishing you all a very good day. <laughs>